We pray for us this morning. Man, uh, I am glad that you're here. Um, and I do have to just ask, what about that panel we had last week for those of you that were here? I mean, look at those good-looking people on the stage. Didn't they do an awesome job? I mean, they did an outstanding job. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Anna. Matthew, Anna. I got confused there for a moment. Got you. I'm with you. Man, I, I'm always in awe of the people we have in Ashworth who can bring such insight and wisdom into this topic that we've been talking about, our mental and emotional health and how that impacts our spiritual health. And they even gave us some very practical things that we can do and to, you know, just to take better care of ourselves in everyday life. So thank you all. Thanks, Amy, for also being a part of that. And I did hear, though, over the last couple of weeks that the message I preached a couple of weeks ago, that some people left here thinking, I need more which I'm very grateful for. I don't get that all the time. I mean, you know, if you leave and you think I need more, I, I want to go with that, right? But I think the topic began to strike a nerve with us. I think it began to hit home for a lot of us. Um, and if you don't remember, if you've forgotten, it's been a couple of weeks or maybe you weren't here, that first message, we talked about crossing the line. That's the series we're in about relational health and mental health and all these things. But it was about crossing that line with ourselves. And I said that knowing ourselves is a part of knowing God. And we even looked at several quotes, but I'll put one of them back up here again. It's from Augustine. It's one that he said in the 5th century. And he said, how can you draw close to God when you are far from your own self? What does that mean? It means that coming close to God, there has to be an honesty within us about who we really are, about all the, all the stuff, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We have to really be willing to lean into these things because otherwise, what does that mean? It means we're approaching God with a mask. We're approaching God with a facade of what we think God wants us to be, but not the real me. And I love his prayer that's up there, grant, Lord, that I may know myself that I may know thee. And I heard, though, that after the message a couple weeks ago, that there may be a, been a question going around, and it was just simply this, how can I know myself? How can I know myself? Okay, I want to know myself, but how? And uh, that, that's where we want to dive in today. How do we know ourselves? Um, just a reminder, if you have questions through the series, one of the things we want to do is we want to be able to answer some of those questions. So message today. I'm going to spend it. If you take your phone out, feel free to take it out. If something pops in your mind, text any questions you have to 515-518-0998. That's a Google voice number for the church that we get. And uh, at the end of the series or even maybe after the series, we'll, we'll take time to answer these questions either in a service or even in a video or something else. But we want, we want to know what's on your mind and how are you, how are these messages impacting you and how are you responding? So how can I know myself? That's the question. How do we do that? Where do we start? Well, if we're not careful or if we're unwilling to take a good look, a deep look, it can really become like a game of guess who. Anybody like to play guess who? Guess who's an awesome game, right? It's fun. It's amazing. But how do we take our identity into the guess who world? Well, if we're not careful, what our identity becomes or what we think of ourselves is nothing more than what you can see in the mirror. I mean, isn't that what Guess Who's really about? It's all about what you can see. So what do we say? We say things like this. Is your person a man? Yes. Is your person someone with an oval face? Yes. Does your person have gray hair? Yes. Does your person have a gray beard? That's offensive, but yes. Uh, with light skin, yes. Uh, doesn't wear glasses, but is blind as a bat and has to wear contacts, yes. Okay, guess who might not have that one? That's what we do, right? I mean, we look in the mirror and we say, well, this is who I am. I'm a 50-year-old guy. I have, you know, I, I have graying hair, you know. See, graying is how I want to keep thinking about it. And they'd say, okay, that's who I am. Is that me? No. That's what I look like. I mean, that's what we go to. We go to this game of guess who with ourselves, and we think, okay, that's my identity, but it's really not. But sometimes we'll get really bold. I mean, really bold. And when we'll go beyond the mirror, and we'll start asking the questions about the roles that we play. Well, is your person a pastor? Yes. Is your person a husband, or maybe in your case, a wife? Is your person a dad or a mom? 
Are they athletic? Are they nerdy? Are they musical? Are they, you know, do they, do they work with spreadsheets? Do they whatever, you know? And we think that, yeah, I got you there on that one, Garrett, didn't I? Work with spreadsheets. Yes, that's the one I was waiting for. <laughs> that's funny. Um, but even then, does that really get to the heart of who we are? Not really. I mean, really, these first two things that we're talking about, these first two questions really don't tell us much more than the surface level things that anyone could find out about us on our Facebook profile, right? I mean, that's mine from last night. There you go. That's Brent right there. But is that Brent? No. Are we really leaning into and discovering who we really are? And if what Augustine and many others have said is true, that knowing God is somewhat dependent upon knowing ourselves, we've got to be willing to take maybe some very uncomfortable steps forward towards discovering who we really are. Now, even saying that is fraught with many challenges. We talked a couple weeks ago about how denial is very real, and sometimes we like to just ignore things and act like they're not there. But beyond that, this, there's challenges of over finding out who we are, primarily The biggest challenge I think we face is we are just eaten up with false narratives of who we are. We're eaten up with even bad theology. I mean, Noel very vulnerably shared just a few minutes ago about some of the things, exactly what I'm talking about. These false narratives, this bad theology that convinces us that it's better for us to pretend to be somebody than to be who we actually are, even if it means pretending to God. Because, but the reality is, how helpful is that? It's not. You see, we have to realize that we haven't existed in a bubble. There have been a lot of factors that have contributed to who we are. A lot of factors contributing to our identity. I mean, just think for a moment. What has made up who you are today? Now, sure, some of it's n- nature. You know, I mean, I, as a parent, I have to admit, when we had our three biological children, nothing surprised me more that each of these children came from my wife and three of them have very three distinct personalities. I don't know how it happened. They are not similar. They are not the same person. We raised them the same, but none of our parenting techniques worked across for all of them. They, they constantly challenged us. How is that? Well, some of that is nature. But, and some of it is also nurture. How we were raised, the relationship that you had with your parents, shaped you. Good, bad, indifferent, it shaped you. I mean, the panel last week was talking about attachment styles and how we interacted with our family shapes and forms even the relationships we have as adults and can even shape and impact the relationship we have with God. Disclaimer here, this is not a time for us to go, well, it's all my mother's fault, okay? I mean, I feel like that's the, that used to be the answer in psychology, right? You go, yeah, she's not here, so we can blame her. Yeah, no, the answer is not, it's not your mom's fault, it's not your dad's fault. Although they may have shaped you, when we cross that threshold of adulthood, we have to start owning our own stuff, okay? We can't constantly just push it backwards. Um, Maybe, though, you were shaped by your peers. Maybe the way you experienced school was a big impact. Maybe you were the popular kid. Maybe you ran with the popular crowd. You had everything at your disposal. I wouldn't know what that was like. That was not me. I was the little scrawny kid that was picked on, you know, that was bullied. Those things shape you. Maybe how you interact with your boss at work and your coworkers at work. Maybe you're the stellar employee that's always getting praise. Or maybe not. Maybe you're the employee that's not getting the praise and you're getting the performance improvement plans and those kind of things. That those things continue to shape you. Our culture certainly has a role in this. Our culture shapes us tremendously, especially depending on what we possess, which our culture says is very important, or your status in the community, which they continue to say matters significantly. What's interesting to me is that when we, and religion, I should say religion, religion also shapes us. How we grew up, what our spiritual background is, has a tremendous impact as well. 
But what's interesting, especially with those last two, with the culture and religious piece, is that those I find to be very unhelpful sometimes. And what do I mean by that? Because I think those two, the religious side of things and the cultural side of things, are two far extremes of a pendulum that just loves to swing and smack me in the face as it goes back and forth. What does culture say? Culture, culture comes in and says, you know what? You're perfect just the way you are. Don't ever change. Don't ever change. Now, it's a nice message, isn't it? It's a message I want to hear. It's a message I know is not true. Anybody else with me on that one? Mm -hmm. I mean, as much as I want somebody to look at me and say, oh, my gosh, you're just so amazing. You're awesome. You're perfect. Don't ever change. I go, I know what happens. I know the reality of my life. I know the struggles. I know the challenges. I know when I drive down I-235 and somebody cuts me off the one finger wave that I really want to give them because it's there. It's that reactionary piece. I know that's part of me. And I know sometimes it's the, I, I want to deaden myself to the feelings and emotions that I have. So I'll, you know, turn on Netflix and just find some stupid show that I'm really not that interested in because at least it's a distraction from really having to deal with the fact that I just yelled at my kid and I reacted in a way that wasn't very Christ-like or even just good as a parent to do. Or even the fact that sometimes I know I live so selfishly that I could do more, I could step out, but I don't. And even though sometimes the culture wants to say, but you're perfect, you're good just the way you are. I'm like, I, dear God, I hope not. I hope this isn't it. I hope this isn't that I have to resign myself to, well, this is just as good as you get. Oh, I don't want that. But then the pendulum swings, as I said, and often knocking us around in the process. And we don't hear the you're perfect message. From the religious side of things, we hear the other message. Well, you're worthless. You're a worm. You're such a terrible, horrible person. And we feel that sometimes. Like I said, you yell at your kid or, you know, you do other things. You let relationships go too far when they shouldn't. You lie just a little or a lot about something. You turned a blind eye to somebody in need. And we assume we are nothing more than our actions at our weakest moments. And so we fall into that trap. Oh, my goodness. I am the worst person in the world. And religion sometimes helps accentuate that message. Now, I will say sometimes in the religious world, we take that and we run with it as this false humility kind of thing. Oh, I'm such a worm, and then we don't really believe it. But what do you do? You're worthless. No, oh, you're perfect. You are what you do. You are what you say. You, your, your identity is what you can produce or achieve. It's the stuff you possess. It's even what others think of you. What do you do with that? Would it surprise you to know that even Jesus was tempted in this area? That Jesus himself was even tempted to be known by something other than he really was? Fascinating story in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus is beginning his ministry. He's about 30 years old. He starts by going to John and being baptized. Didn't need to be, but he did, setting us this beautiful example. And then after his baptism, we read that he goes into the wilderness for 40 days. And let's just take a look at this. Matthew chapter 4, it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Fascinating that it says led by the Spirit. So Jesus is exactly where he's supposed to be at this point. But he is there, and he's going to be tempted. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Well, there's a statement of the obvious. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Now, that's an that's a easy one right there, right? Oh, I'm hungry. I can do it. Let's make this happen, Jesus. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point on the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Prove yourself, Jesus. You say you're something. Let's see it. Jesus answered him. And it's also written, don't put the Lord your God to the test. 
So again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All of this I will give you. I'll give you everything. You can own it all if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said, away from me, Satan, for it's written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. I mean, let's put ourselves in this scenario for just a moment. Imagine what this would have been like. Those temptations are challenging on our best days. They are challenging when I've had three square meals and eight hours of sleep and that Satan comes to me and they're still very challenging. But this happens to Jesus after he has spent 40 days in the wilderness fasting, no food. Just picture for a moment how weak Jesus would have been in that moment. How weak would you have been in that moment? And at one of the weakest moments in his life, in your life, you're tempted to question everything, even question who you are. I mean, look at the temptations, just how they break down real quick. Stones to bread. What is, this, what is the Satan trying to tempt him with? Physical food, yes. For somebody extremely hungry, that makes sense. But it's a temptation to performance. Prove yourself. Show me. Prove, do this. Can you do it? If you can, do it. And in, the, in this question, there's almost, I don't think you can. Kind of that reverse psychology thing, right? I don't think you're as powerful as you say you are. Prove yourself. Come on, do it. And Jesus has the perfect response. He says, I don't have to prove myself by my performance. Jesus says, I am more than what I do. I am who God says I am. The second temptation is around his position or his popularity. You know, well, then if you won't do the bread, well, then let's see if you're as cared for as you think you are. Let's see if you're as popular. The Bible says, you know what? You jump, angels are going to come get you. You're going to be taken care of. Will the angels really rescue? I don't think they will. And what about everyone else? What will they say about you? If you do this, they will love you. Again, Jesus looks at Satan and says, this is pointless. You don't test God. My popularity, my position isn't determined by your silly test. And the last one has to do with possessions. I'll give you everything. Just bow down to me. And I love Jesus' response. He's had enough. Get lost. Get out. I'm done with you. Possessions, even owning everything there is, is a poor substitute for the life that God offers. Jesus is reminding us God is all we need. If only I found it this easy when temptations came my way. But did you notice that explicitly in the first two temptations, and I think implicitly in the third, how the, how the tempter came at him? He preceded each temptation with these words. If you are the Son of God. What is that? That's an attack on the identity of Jesus. If you are the Son of God. What? What do you mean, am I, if I am the Son of God? See, it's that question. And you can put your name in there. If you are the child of God. If you are the son or the daughter of God. It's always going to be a question of identity. That thing to keep you away from, the thing to push you further away from, knowing and experiencing God. It's like this. It's like Genesis chapter 3 all over again. You see, the problem wasn't in Genesis chapter 3 that Adam and Eve were told, oh, you can be like God. I mean, that was the temptation, but they were already in that sphere. God had given them everything. He says, you're co-ruling with me. I've elevated you to this incredible status. The question wasn't for them, do you want to be like God? The question for them was, do you want to be like God without God? Do you want to be him without him? And that's the continual temptation that we face and Jesus faced here. You see, so what's amazing to me and so what's absurd to me about this interaction in Matthew's gospel is, as I said, it comes right after the baptism of Jesus in Matthew chapter 3. Do you remember that story? Do you remember John has this moment, John the baptizer, and Jesus comes and says, hey, I want you to baptize me. John's like, I don't think so. I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus is like, look, John, chill. This needs to happen so that the righteousness of God can be revealed. And John's like, all right, done. So they go down into the water. 
John baptizes Jesus, and as Jesus comes up, this miraculous thing happens. The heavens open up. A dove descends from heaven, and this booming voice projects, This is my son, and I am well pleased with him. I love him. Now think about this. Jesus has experienced that. And 40 days later, the question was, well, if you are the Son of God. And if that's such a temptation for Jesus, I wonder how huge is that a temptation even for us? I mean, it was very clear for Jesus, wasn't it? This is my Son. But even after seeing the skies open, hearing the voice of God, that temptation came for Jesus. And it will come for you too. And Jesus was able to overcome it because he knew who he was. You see, we have to be willing to look at the false narratives that we believe about ourselves. Those things that become a part of who we are. Even if we may not realize it, those things that we're trying so hard to hide the fear, and the anxiety we have, the selfishness, the possessiveness, the self-destructive tendencies, the self-promotion, and the self-indulgence, all those things, we have to be willing to look at them. Why? Because nothing good happens when we keep those things hidden and in the darkness. God invites us to reject the false narratives, to get to the real us. But in order to get there, We have to own who we really are. And it's really kind of silly, isn't it? Because even in our relationship with God, I think we do it with others too, we try to create that facade. But I'm not this way. I don't have this struggle. And we assume that we can keep those things hidden from God. And I get it. It's frightening. It's terrifying to think I have to own my anger. I have to own the temptations, the the lustful thoughts that you have, the lies that you might be tempted to tell, to own these things. And if we're not careful, what we'll do is we'll get trapped into this thinking that the best thing we can do is either hide them or just manage them. And neither of those things bring us closer to Jesus. Now, Amy recommended a book to me this week, and I read it, and it was amazing, and I'm recommending it to you. It's called The Gift of Being Yourself. The Sacred Call to Self-Discovery by a guy named David Benner. Benner? Brenner. Brenner. Does it say Brenner? Benner. Thank you. A lot of what I'm going to tell you comes from his writings. Because he talks, to, he talks about knowing ourselves and, and knowing God. And he talks just about how when we refuse to know ourselves, what we do is we kind of build up this idea of who we are that just puffs us up even religiously puffs us up. And he says this, he says, self-knowledge that is pursued apart from our identity in relationship to God easily leads to self-inflation. This is the puffed up grandiose self Paul warns about, an arrogance to which we are vulnerable, vulnerable when knowledge is valued more than love. And see, and this is where we have to come back and take this step. There's kind of this thing going on, these two things happening at the same time, knowing myself and knowing God. And see, but then we have to take a step back even and say, okay, but how much do I know God? How well do I know God? And this is where for us, many times we go, well, I know plenty about God. Well, that's good. Could you pass the test? Great. But do you know God? Do you know God relationally? Do you know God experientially? Benner says again in his book, he says, having information about God is no more transformational than having information about love. Theories and ideas about God can sit in sturdy storage canisters in our mind and do absolutely no good. We've got to be willing to lean in because once we know ourselves and we know God in these relational things, it helps us to be able to move forward. You see, we sit and we think we can hide these things from God. We sit and we think we can have a mask with God, but we really can't. And really, when it comes to knowing God, that could be a sermon all on its own. In fact, years ago, we did a series on knowing God, and maybe we'll come back to it. But what I'd want you to understand today is in order to know ourselves and know God, it begins with knowing that, well, it's really what we've already been singing about. God is love. God is love. And it's not just that God is love. 
It's that God loves you. Sit with that for a moment. God loves you. You are God's beloved. I mean, Trevor Hudson wrote this. He said, Jesus reveals the truth of our own belovedness. Notice how this repeatedly occurs in, his, in the gospel encounter, sharing a meal with those rejected and marginalized, responding to the desperate cry of a blind beggar by the roadside, requesting the company of an unscrupulous tax collector, refusing to condemn a woman caught in adultery. That's the type of love we're talking about. <laughs> in his book, Hope and Suffering, Archbishop Desmond Tutu wrote this, We don't need to prove ourselves to God. Listen to that again. We don't need to prove ourselves to God. We don't have to do anything at all to be acceptable to him. That is what Jesus came to say, and for that it got him killed. He came to say, hey, you don't have to earn God's love. It's not a matter of human achievement. You exist. You exist because of God's love for you already. You are a child of divine love. And just in case you need one more example to understand this, Karl Barth who was asked to summarize, a 20th century theologian was asked to summarize the essence of his beliefs. And after a lifetime of theological exploration, do you know what he said? How he described it? He said this, he said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. We can complicate this, we can sit in classes to study it, but that's it right there. That's it. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible, for the life of Jesus, tells me so. And we need to sit here in this for a while, not just knowing it in our heads, but experiencing it relationally. It has to become the basis of who we are. We have to live in this truth of God's love. In fact, I've, ta- I've shared before, I, I did a nine-month journey through what's called the Ignatian Exercises. And uh, it was like six weeks I had to spend on sin, my sin. Sounds terrible, right? But do you know what you have to do before you get to that six-week period? You spend four weeks examining God's love. Do you know why? Because sin is crushing without the love of God. Sin can't be stood up under without the love of God. You see, there's somewhere we've gotten in our minds that if we just fake it, our way through it, or we pretend, then that's okay. But part of owning ourself is this self-acceptance in knowing who we are in God. And when we begin to name these things out loud to God, they lose their power over us. And the longer we sit in the presence of Jesus, the more we begin to be shaped by him. When we understand fully the love of God, we can freely admit, you know what, I'm a sinner. I mean, you think about Paul, the Apostle Paul and his writings. The longer he knew Jesus towards the end of his life, he was able to say things like this. You know what? I'm the worst sinner in the world. And I'm going to tell you, I don't think Paul's being falsely humble there. I think he's going, yeah, I'm a pretty screwed up guy. I've messed up horribly. But then he also makes these statements like, but in my weakness, his strength is made perfect. It is by his grace that I have been saved. I mean, these are the things that Paul was able to say. We can admit these things. We can admit our brokenness. To be human is to be a sinner, but we just don't focus on the sin. We don't try to manage our sin away. Our our goal is not sin avoidance. You know why? Because even though we may have sin, we are deeply loved. We are a deeply loved sinner. The late pastor Tim Keller wrote this. He said, the gospel, the good news of Jesus is this. You are far worse than you ever imagined and far more loved than you could ever dream. Talk about the paradox of holding two things in in reality at the same time. God says, I love you, warts and all. I see in you more than you could ever possibly see in yourself. And when we know this God and we can come to him and sit in his presence, you know what we have to hold back? Nothing. We can bring the reality of who we are and in doing so discover his embrace. And then we can begin to allow the Holy Spirit to unwind some of these things within us, to undo these things that have tripped us up and to transform us into the image of Christ. And as I said, there's a mystery here. It's a paradox here. It's in losing ourselves that we find ourselves. That's what Jesus said. And how do we know ourselves? 
by knowing God, moving beyond the shame-based religion, realizing that Paul says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's living in the truth that you are more than what you want. You're more than what you say. You're more than what others say. You're more than the stuff you own. Owning who we are, realizing, noticing the things about our lives, the, the voices, as Noel talked about, the voices that we're listening to, noticing the things that agitate you. Why? Because usually the things that agitate you and somebody else are the things that are glaringly part of who you are. Be aware of the image you're trying to project to others, especially on social media. Begin to drill down and ask yourself, why am I trying to do this? And then, why did I say that? Why did I react that way? Why did I post that? We pray for an openness to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit reveals to us Spending time in silence and solitude in the presence of God and then allowing others into our lives to speak into our lives, to get to know the real us in community. And Pastor Amy's going to talk more about that next week. I want to close with just this right here. We live into the false self very easily. You know why? It's what we know and it's comfortable. And sometimes it's uncomfortable to really have to drill down and say, who am I? But in doing so, we forget that God wants something better for us. There's one more passage I want to share today, and it's just simply this. Worship team, go ahead and come. Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, and he wants, them to, rem- he wants to remind them that Jesus has given them life and what, they, what they've done, what Jesus has done for them. In Ephesians chapter 2, he reads his words. He says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved. And then a few verses later, look at what he writes. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork. We are his masterpiece. You are his divinely written poetry, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Don't miss who you are in Christ. I can't say it any better. Tim Keller said it this way. He said, do you know what this means, that you are God's workmanship? What is art? Art is beautiful. Art is valuable. Art is an expression of the inner being of the maker, of the artist. Imagine what this means for you. You are beautiful. You are valuable. You are an expression of the very inner being of the artist, the divine artist, God himself. You see, when Jesus gave himself on the cross, he didn't say, I'm going to die just so you know I love you. He said, I'm going to die. I'm going to bleed for your splendor. I'm going to recreate you into something beautiful. I will turn you into something splendid, something magnificent. I'm the artist. You're the art. I'm the painter. You're the canvas. I'm the sculptor. You're the marble. You don't look like much in the quarry, but I can see, oh, I can see Jesus is an artist. And you, beloved, are his crowning achievement. You are his masterpiece. Genuinely knowing yourself as you are known by God can be one of the scariest things in the world. But if God knows who you are and he still loves you deeply, there is hope that you and I can do the same. And let me encourage you, as you play guess who with your life this week, Ask yourself the question, who am I? Reflect on knowing yourself through the lens of God's love. When you think of God looking at you, what's his face look like? Is he mad? Does he have a furrowed brow? Or like the loving father, is he smiling over you, singing over you, dancing over you? And let's make this our prayer this week. Grant, Lord, that I may know myself, that I may know Thee. Father, it's a scary journey, probably one we'd rather not take. But when it comes to our knowing You, we want to lean into knowing ourselves. Help us to see us as You see us. And help us to not be afraid to acknowledge the sin that exists there. We don't have to be afraid of that sin. Jesus died on the cross for that. We're not under its power. We've been set free. 
It's only when we try to convince ourselves it isn't there that we find it still has power over us. And you sit with us and you say, let me just show you how I see you. Let me show you how much I love you. I've given myself completely for you. Let us lean into answering this question, God, how do I know myself? It's by seeing myself the way you see me. In Jesus' name.